Good morning. Welcome to Chemistry 221. Uh, I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, I'll say a lot of information this morning, but I just want to make sure that everybody's in the right classroom, they got the right class, etc., etc. This is Chem 221. Uh, my name, Dr. Michael Russell. You can call me Dr. Russell, Dr. Michael, Michael, Mike is fine. Don't call me Mikey. If you call me Mikey, we're going to have a problem. I'll just step outside. But life cereal, 70s. All right. Uh, best way to get a hold of me, email by far, mike.russell at mhcc.edu. If you email me by 8 o'clock on a regular day, I will get back to you the same night. If I'm watching Game of Thrones or something, it may be closer to past 8 o'clock, but, um, but I will get back to you. So definitely let me know if you have questions on anything. It doesn't have to be Chem 221 related. It could be anything. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here real fast is the website for this class, mhchem.org slash 221. It's not part of Blackboard, it's not part of the My MHCC portal, although you can get there that way. You can literally put this right into your browser or your computer and get there. Um, <clears throat> most of uh, our discussion as to what's going to happen in the class, what the class is like, will happen on Friday. Uh, Fridays from uh, 1.10 to no later than 5 is our lab period. And at 1.10 we'll meet in 25.01. Uh, to get there you go to the higher level. And 25.01 is pretty close to the F parking lot. Um, you'll find it down there kind of on the end, by, between the science and the math department. And at that time, that's when we'll go over how the class works and stuff like that. If you have a chance before Friday at 1.10 p.m. to get the companion, or at least order it, that would be really awesome. The companion is kind of like uh, my uh, collection of problem sets, labs, uh, different kind of study sets and stuff that you'll need. Uh, one person already called it the book, which I'm actually kind of honored, although kind of ashamed too that there's that much paper waste of it. Anyway, it's basically everything that I've kind of put together that'll help you this class. Um, the actual textbook is a free open source book. You do not have to pay for it. If you do want a printed copy, you can purchase one uh, from Amazon or something like that. They're about 50 bucks. But honestly, unless you physically want that hard book in front of you, I would recommend just scanning it and stuff uh, from the place. If you have questions on anything, let me know, including right now. Is there any burning question that you have that you'd like to ask? Yes. You said you're watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do. I've been watching the new one and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, I think Andor from Star Wars, honestly, is kind of taking my interest more. But I do like the Game of Thrones a lot too. Did you ever read the books? I read the Game of Thrones books, although I have not read the book that the new series is based on. Have you read it? Is it? Cool? In lab, I'll try to introduce you to our lab people, which are Corey and Brenda. And Corey is really into George R. R. Martin stuff and everything. So you have good taste in stuff. As you can tell, it's very informal. So if you think of things, you know, star sign is Scorpio. Oh, sorry. I did, I, uh, no. uh, <laughs> you don't know. This is astronomy, not astronomy. It's chemistry, excuse me. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Are you a doctor? Yes. I got my PhD from Dartmouth College. Uh, my background is metals in organic chemistry. I'll talk about that a little bit off and on. Uh, so yeah, but you know, you can call me doctor, professor, but you can also just say Michael. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. So normally, what this class is like, all right, lectures like today, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 o'clock at 9.50, it says 10 up there, I should have put 9.50. Um, and I'll talk about the different materials, so you have input into what we're going to be looking at and stuff. Now, this thing right here, which I apologize if it's in your space at all, uh, this is how I record the lectures. And I will post these lectures after the lecture a couple hours, and I post them to uh, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Mars Mars 2, or is it MH? No, it's Mars Mars. Anyway, whatever. And I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, if I say something and it doesn't make sense, just email me later, okay? But anyway, I'll post them to YouTube, and I also have a podcast you can follow if you're a podcast person. Um, also, the lecture notes uh, will be in the companion, and you can go along and make notes on the side. Some of the things we'll look at will be like, you know, 34 grams of this and 17 milliliters. Well, instead of writing all that down, I'm hoping that you can just write notes on the side of the actual pieces. Now, I update my notes constantly. 
So if the version in the companion isn't quite right, I do apologize. But it was current as of uh, June or so when I started this process of making the companion for the bookstore and stuff. So yeah, I definitely recommend you get the companion. You will need printed materials. Um, the labs, definitely. Uh, I recommend looking at the problem sets and stuff, too. Now, labs for this section, which are section 01, by the way, are a really important time, all right? And those will be Fridays from 1.10 to 5 p.m. Um, they'll start in room 2501, and 2501 to get there, you go up the stairs and go that way just a little bit. Um, it's between the science and math departments. And so it's, I think it's pretty easy to find, but definitely ask around and stuff if you can't find it. And then at about 3 o'clock, 3.10 or so, we'll move to an actual lab room, which is 2507, which is close by 2501. Um, for this first week, for this Friday, if you can bring a printed copy of the Eight Bottles Lab, all right, which is on the website, you can print it from there, or it's in the companion if you have it already, no problem. Bring the Eight Bottles Lab and your calculator and you'll be good to go, all right? Now, this week, I know everybody's like struggling just to figure out, you know, what time of the day it is and I will have some copies of the Eight Bottles Lab this week. In the future, though, I do want you to bring your own printed copy with you. Um, you'll make your notes on the printed copy and you'll turn it in the following week. That's kind of the punchline. Now, this week you don't need safety goggles or safety glasses, but eventually you will. And if you have the chance, what I recommend is you just go to the dollar store or something like that, or dollar fifty store, or whatever their fashion's calling it. I'll bring Prof. Hat back on. I say it's Prof. Hat back on when I kind of get off the rails a little bit. Anyway, you will need some kind of protection at some time. And so if you go to the dollar store or the equivalent and you buy a pair, awesome. Now, if you're planning on taking like organic chemistry next year, you can buy a fan fancier version for about 20 bucks off Amazon and those will last all the way through organic chemistry and they are better goggles. However, for this class, if you just want to do the dollar store, fantastic. But again, that's for uh, future labs, not the lab this week. Yeah. Where can you get the fancy ones? Cool. Um, Amazon has several good pairs. And if you want, uh, email me and I can send you like some yes. suggestions. That's great. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Why not? Um, <clears throat> we used to have a bookstore that was right over there. And we had goggles and scantrons, and I could sell the companion right there. Um, we're adjusting to not having a bookstore. So, anyway, let me know when I can send you. Okay. So, any other questions? All right. Finally, COVID. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm so glad to see all of you. <laughs> all right. Last year, I did have classes on campus, but like we couldn't have office hours, and it was just like a ghost town, man. So I'm really pleased that you're all here and taking care of business. Um, masks are always recommended by the administration, and you can absolutely wear them and no problem. If you want, if you wear a mask, you're welcome. Good to have you here. If you have a mask on and you come ask me a question, I'll put my mask on too. I don't want anybody to feel weird. However, on the other hand, if we're like here, I probably won't keep it on, all right? But if you feel nervous, you just say, hey, can you put your mask on? No harm, no foul. It's in my pocket at all times. I'm good to go. One thing you're supposed to do before you come on campus each time is complete what's called the COVID questionnaire. And to get to it, you can go to mhcc.edu slash COVID and fill it out. Um, they will also send you an email in the morning. I think it's like around 5 a.m. And you can fill it out there, which is easier because it knows who you are. You don't have to put it all in. Um, this is a remnant of the COVID times. Uh, every time I filled it out, I don't have COVID symptoms. I don't think I was around anybody. So you can just push no, submit, no, submit, and then submit again, I think, and you're, and you're good, all right? Um, if you don't fill it out, it's probably not the end of the world. I have access to who has filled it out and who hasn't, and honestly, I could care less. <laughs> all right. However, officially, all right, this is something you're supposed to do. If you work at like the hospital at Mount Hood, you're supposed. This is something they want you to do each time. So different institutions have different adherence to it. Um, if you can do it, it's a mark of coolness. I'm not going to be checking real hardcore about it, but it is something that you're supposed to do. 
On Friday during lab, welcome. On Friday during lab, we will talk more about how the class works, the process of everything and stuff. Any questions on any of this stuff? Right now? Okay. If you do think of questions later and you can't wait till Friday or even Wednesday, again, make sure you email me and stuff. And by the way, <laughs> I cough, not because I have COVID, mind you, but because I'm trying to give you a hint, maybe, of something that's coming up. But anyway, <laughs> that's one of those coughs. If you, sh you should definitely check your Saints email. I sent a message out yesterday. Some of you have already seen it. But if you haven't seen it and stuff, uh, check it out. Read it thoroughly. Okay, that was my best hint at a, at a link. Anyway, uh, if you do that before Tuesday at midnight, it might be worth your time. Questions. Let's talk chemistry. What is chemistry? I don't know. No, of course I do. I'm the PhD, right? Anyway, let's talk about what chemistry is, what makes it up, and stuff like that. Oh, but first. How would you describe chemistry? Chemistry. Chemistry. Okay. In a fashion. Quick answer, all of that was chemistry. Chemistry is one of the physical sciences. It's one of the things that makes up everything that we do and everything that we see. Chemistry is about how matter transforms and how energy transforms. So from them putting the uh, sunblock lotion on the person's nose, which by the way, I didn't do this summer, oh, bad scene, I you know, basically cleared my normal color. But anyway, uh, suntan lotion is absolutely chemistry, as well as the mechanics to make like a bicycle or to allow a kayak to go through the river. Uh, physics and chemistry go really hand in hand. It's kind of like the base of how things move. Chemistry is the science of matter, of its properties, and of its transformations. All matter is made from about a hundred elemental forms, the elements. Intrinsic to matter is energy. The waves of the ocean are energy made manifest and obvious. But energy permeates even the most subtle interactions of matter, and is fundamental to chemistry. A lot of people realize that chemistry is like transformations, explosions, color changes, stuff like that, and that is a fun part of chemistry. But another part of chemistry is the energy, all right? Energy is just as important to chemistry as the matter interactions are. And in this class, we'll talk about both of them and how they interact and how we can measure all these different aspects of a chemical reaction. Now, chemistry, the name, is really kind of interesting, all right? Chemistry, they feel, the name chemistry comes from chemia, all right? That's the, apparently the ancient Egyptian process of embalming the dead, all right? Um, later on, this process was a step, was applied to metallurgy, like using metals and stuff like that. However, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because chemistry has always been, on one level or another, associated with dead things. <laughs> so anyway, so chemistry sometimes as being seen as a cult. And even today, people say, oh, chemistry, the four-letter word science. And I don't agree with that, of course, and my goal will be to help you realize that chemistry is actually pretty cool. But just realize that there's a little bit of a taboo here of fighting against historically. Matter is made of atoms. When two atoms of the element hydrogen are bound to a single atom of the element oxygen, they form a molecule of water. Atoms and molecules are amazingly small. Because atoms and molecules are, in a practical sense, impossible to see individually, scientists often depend on models when working with and discussing them. A single drop of water contains more than two and a half billion trillion water molecules. Has anybody seen the Atlantic Ocean in person? It's no problem. All right, it's big. <laughs> all right, you can't see England or anything like that. All right. Oh, let's say I put a teaspoon of water down just now by accidentally doing this. 
I just put more molecules of water in the sink than there are teaspoons of water in the Atlantic Ocean. So again, let's assume this was a teaspoon of water. I put more molecules of water down the drain just now than there are teaspoons of water. And the Atlantic is like the Pacific, right? It's huge, all right? And wow, that would be a lot of teaspoons, man. But anyway, uh, these things, these molecules are really small, all right? And so we can't see them. Like biologists will use microscopes and medical people and stuff, and that's really cool. But in this world, we need actually specialized types of equipment. The molecules and the atoms get down to the level of light itself, which is something we'll talk about in chapter six, part one. But anyway, uh, it's really neat. So we're gonna deal with things that are very small and very massive. And that's one thing that makes chemistry kind of unique too. Like astronomy will deal with just massive distances and massive powers of 10 to describe it. But chemistry deals with massive numbers too in terms of numbers of atoms, numbers of molecules. But we also deal with really small numbers too. We're gonna get down to the the length between atoms and water and stuff, and the values are really, really small. So the magnitude of numbers is one thing that makes chemistry kind of unique amongst all the sciences. Chemistry, the name, has come through many different changes, all right? Uh, Keem apparently was Earth a long time ago, and then there's Kamiya, which was like the Egyptian thing, and the Arabic alchemy, which is kind of chemist's half-sister and stuff like that from a long time ago. Uh, chemistry was Boyle, one of the first true, like, chemistry uh, people in 1661. And then finally, it's finally come out in the modern day as chemistry. So all of these things are related to, if not in fact part of the pathway Way of becoming chemistry itself, which is kind of cool, so. Matter changes. Atoms and molecules are in constant motion. Heat increases this motion. The amount of motion dictates how well atoms and molecules can hold on to each other. The less motion there is, the better the hold, and the more solid the matter. When liquid water is cold enough, its molecules arrange in a particular structure and turn to ice. When heated, the vigorous motion of liquid water molecules separates them from one another, and they become an invisible gas. Now, another thing that's kind of weird for people sometimes when they start is how matter can take on different forms. And I want to highlight here something that I hope is so, somewhat relevant to you, which is just water, all right? And some of you might have, I'm not going to check, but some of you, who knows what you have in your flask, but anyway, oh, some of you probably have water in your flask, which is the liquid form of water, H2O, all right? On the other hand, if it's a hot day, like it's supposed to be pretty nice today, you might want to put some of that liquid water in the freezer and make ice cubes, all right? That's still H2O. But the difference between liquids, which flow, and solids is how the molecules interact with each other, how they change. And that's another big part of chemistry. Now, on the other hand, you want some coffee after listening to me for a while, which I understand. You might want to take some of that water and heat it up. And some of the water would turn into steam. Steam is the gas version of water. And all those versions, all right, steam, liquid water, and ice, they're all H2O, but it's how they interact with each other that makes them that way. That's going to be something we're going to focus on in this class as well, like how matter changes from one phase to the other. Matter interacts with other matter and is transformed. Life is perhaps the most complex expression of chemical interaction. Living things transform matter to further their own being. They are transformations of matter. Life radically changed the chemistry of Earth and its atmosphere. 70% of the oxygen in the air is produced by microscopic plants in the oceans, and the rest comes from land plants. Complete understanding of the chemistry of even the simplest forms of life is beyond our present comprehension. We are in the century of biology. The Human Genome Project and things like that have supposedly revolutionized. We're starting to understand more about how the different things sequence, blah, blah, blah. But we're not quite to the area where chemistry is understood as well. The interactions are much smaller and much more subtle. And so that's one thing where chemists are always working on. And life itself is essentially a chemical expression on one level, but it's incredibly complicated. But that's exciting, hopefully, to you too. 
to because there's still work to be done in chemistry, all right? I'm not just gonna be sitting up here and say, well, this is all there is in chemistry, that's all there is to know. No, 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 there's lots of things left to discover and that's why I hope some of you will check this out and see what's going on. Chemistry is the science of matter and of its transformations. The equipment this diver wears allows him to breathe underwater for a very long time. The carbon dioxide he exhales reacts with chemicals in his apparatus to produce oxygen, which he can then rebreathe. This diver can explore the sea with greater freedom because chemists have helped develop every piece of equipment he uses. Chemists press the frontiers of knowledge in laboratories and offices with test tubes and computers. In the pursuit of the practical, they too are explorers. Chemists uh, definitely have a lot of things left to discover, all right? And that's what they're trying to say here. Now, scuba diving, which is I used to do a long time ago, pretty fun. But anyway, it wouldn't be possible without the discovery of chemistry, like making the wetsuits and the way that the oxygen goes out and the CO2 goes out the other flask. I mean, it's amazing how these things work out. Um, chemists, in their own ways, have similar types of adventures. And of course, I'm biased, and I think it's really cool. But um, they're also exploring different ways to do things. And that's what I'll try and share with you throughout this. Term. So anyway, at the end of all this, you're probably like, okay, chemistry, yeah, cool. Well, maybe there are some things of chemistry that aren't so cool. People make molecules for all kinds of reasons. One of them is that a molecule is beautiful. That, for instance, is uh, the case with this fantastic platonic polyhedron, as it's called, of dodecahedra, with uh, 20 carbon atoms in it, with 12 faces of pentagons. This was made. Not too long ago, by a friend of mine at Ohio State, Leo Piquet. Now, he made it because it was a goal, a mountain to be climbed. Many people had tried, no one had made it, and it's aesthetically pleasing in its symmetry. You see this gracefully curving triple helix? Now, this structure has not been made. What I see is that it's, it's pretty, it's beautiful. So Dr. Hoffman is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, the high, one of the highest things you can ever establish. And he is, his contributions to chemistry are without, without a doubt fantastic. However, he's kind of an interesting person. He, uh, he goes off on the beauty of molecules. And there is a beauty, I will say, but the way he described it just kind of makes me cringe a little bit. He's also big for poetry. Now, I love poetry. Walt Whitman's one of my favorites. However, his poetry leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, there was no question that the reaction worked, but transient colors were seen in the slurry of sodium methoxide, in dichloromethane, and we get warming and get the ketone. It's kind of awkward to use, I think, chemistry in this kind of context in art, but anyway, that's cool. So I would say definitely stick to his chemistry, don't worry about the art. He also made a play that was in Washington, D.C. called Oxygen, and Oxygen, I think, ran for two nights before it was shut down because nobody wanted wanted to see it, but anyway, so I want you to know that chemistry is cool, but maybe we can't take it everywhere in the world, like too far. Anyway, other famous chemists besides Dr. Kaufman. Uh, first of all, one of my personal favorites, Dolph Lundgren. All right, he was the bad guy in uh, the Rocky movie, the Russian guy, but I, he's a really cool dude. Anyway, he has a master's in chemistry, and apparently he was somewhere, and they said, hey, you want to be an actor? And he said, okay, and now he's an actor. He was in The Expendables and stuff like that, too. Um, Margaret Thatcher, for better or worse, was the leader of England for quite a while. Uh, she has a bachelor's, or had a bachelor's, she's passed on, a bachelor's in chemistry, which is pretty cool, and she was the prime minister. But amazingly, Pope Francis, the current pope of the Catholic Church, has a master's in chemistry. So, woohoo, you're in good company. Anyway. So, uh, you asked earlier about my PhD, which was really cool. There are several types of chemistry. I'll call them the branches of chemistry, and I'll talk about these throughout the class. Organic chemistry is the biggest branch of chemistry of all. And organic chemistry uh, usually involves studying just a couple of atoms on the periodic table. Now, we're going to talk about the periodic tables a lot in this class on both sides. But basically, organic chemistry, it's mostly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, but that's about it. I mean, they'll, talk, they'll do all the couple other elements, 
And at first, compared to the next one we'll talk about, it might seem that's a pretty small subset. Like, why do they just talk about it? But the reason they talk about it is because that's the chemistry of life. It's the chemistry of vitamins and DNA and all these different things. And organic chemistry is definitely the biggest branch of chemistry. Um, at Mount Hood Community College, I would say that we have five full-time chemists, and two of them are truly organic chemists. However, that's not what I do. <laughs> All right? I listen to a lot of Slayer, no, Metallica, no, I liked heavy metals a lot. That part is true. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> I'm not totally dating myself here. Anyway, ACDC, all right, I'm, shut up, Michael. Prophet back on. Inorganic chemistry is basically the study of everything that's not carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, especially not carbon. Um, it's mostly metals, and that's the kind of chemistry that I actually did. I was fascinated by the blues, purples, greens and stuff that I saw, mostly with chromium, sometimes some tungsten, and molybdenum. Um, that's a really cool field. Now, inorganic is not as big as organic because there's a lot more applications when you can patent drugs and stuff like that. Um, at Mount Hood, myself and Dr. Whitman, who teaches the other Chem 221 class this quarter, we are both truly inorganic chemists. Now, there's also analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, and biochemistry, or biochemical chemistry. Analytical chemistry is a really cool branch. It's about figuring out how much and what kind of stuff you have. Someone hands you a flask of stuff, you don't want to go, 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 all right, because that'll be death in chemistry. So you want to use techniques and chemical tests and machines to figure out what it is, and also how much of it you have, all right? And that's a really fun field. I, uh, if I could redo chemistry, that might be something I would check out. Um, physical chemistry is where physics, chemistry, and calculus all come together, all right? And it's a really wild thing. You can prove some of the laws that we're going to talk about this term. Um, it's a very, of course, heavy math area. Computers have helped a lot. Physical chemistry is very, very interesting. Biochemistry, though, is the most pow popular, probably, field of the up-and-coming branches. Biochemistry is where biology and chemistry come together. And biochemistry is definitely uh, betting on things like the Human Genome Project. There's a Human Proteome Project, which is also kind of related to that area. Biochemists are big into that. The fifth full-time chemist at Mount Hood is a biochemist. Yeah, so it's kind of fun. So we have two organic, two inorganic, one biochemist. We don't really have analytical or physical chemists, but we can wing it and stuff if you ever have questions. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, there's lots of other kinds of chemistry. All right, and some of these maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. So for example, geochemistry is where geology and chemistry come together, and that's a really cool area. Chemical engineering, where chemistry and engineering come together, which is cool. There's astrochemistry, astronomy and chemistry, and a whole bunch of other ones. Chemistry sometimes is seen as the central science because we have so many connections to so many other fields, and that's what's kind of neat. We have connections to not only the more physical chemistries, but then also the environmental chemistries as well, biological chemistries. Whoa. Okay, not quite sure what happened there. Sorry about that, but no problem. Huh. All right, any questions on that? I was discussing. All right. I think it's a bit weird. I'm not quite sure why. In the human uh, language of English, all right, we have uh, 26 letters, A through Z, and we take those letters and put them into words. And from the words, we can make sentences. And obviously, I'm trying my best to communicate, but I obviously get stuck on my tongue sometimes, so not perfect. Uh, chemistry has a type of a language, too. And this is kind of a way that I sometimes talk about these things. What the heck? OK, I have no idea. This thing keeps on saying something that's not happening here. So I'm sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, just a second. I'm sorry about this. I'm not sure. Okay, 
think I figured out what's going on. Sorry about that. Joys of technology. One time I came in, projector didn't come on, my computer didn't work. I had to go totally old school, long story short. I'm still here. Anyway, chemistry, elements, language. All right, right on. So just like in English language we have letters, well, my alphabet has more than a hundred different letters to it. Um, each of those little symbols up there, one letter or oftentimes two, are kind of like a letter in the alphabet, all right? Some letters in the alphabet you can use on their own, like A and I, stuff like that, but they're not very exciting. All of these up here, there's stuff you can do with them individually as well, sometimes more important than others. We're breathing oxygen, all right? Uh, if you have a birthday party, you would want helium balloons maybe because they float, all right? So they do have their own uses. But generally speaking, the more exciting things happen when you put them together. So think of the elements in some ways as like an alphabet, all right? And the alphabet is kind of important. Now, on an actual physical world, those elements, you can't break them down any farther. Like, you can't turn helium there into hydrogen without doing some pretty hardcore kind of science on it. Helium pretty much stays helium. Copper, on the other hand, we can't break copper down and put it into iron, all right? It would take some pretty intense stuff, which we'll talk about in Chem 222. So we think in chemistry that those are like the, the building blocks, all right? You can take the compounds down to elements, but you can't really break the elements down very well. There's lots of elements, some of them are familiar to you and some of them are not. Uh, sodium metal, which is different than sodium chloride, we'll talk about that, is a very soft metal. You can actually cut it with a knife. It reacts really wild with water, it's cool. Aluminum, which is made up of aluminum cans, uh, is something that looks kind of like that, it's something you can touch and hang on to. Bromine uh, is a gas, at, it's arguably a liquid at room temperature, so usually you'll see like this kind of nasty looking Halloween-esque kind of brown fog over it, uh, pretty cool kind of stuff. Uh, this guy is Lavoisier. We'll talk about him off and on. He was one of the real forefathers of chemistry, and he uh, did his stuff in France. He actually came up with the term element, all right? Lavoisier uh, was actually beheaded in the French Revolution. He was part of the aristocrats and stuff, and the people didn't like him. Alas, chemistry can't be dangerous, apparently. Actually, he did it for other reasons, not for his science, as far as I know. But the free was the first one to define elements when it comes to chemistry. <clears throat> now, the periodic table, all right, is where you find my letters of my alphabet, all right? And again, there's quite a few of them. Currently, there are 118 elements. Now, if you look on the periodic tables in this room, there are several pieces missing, all right? And you'll also see like 114 right there has a UUQ, and 114 right there has an FL. This is a very up-to-date periodic table. Periodic tables are always getting out of date, and that's what our big periodic tables in this room are. Uh, I'm gonna try and make the push to get new ones this year. You never know at Mount Hood about the money. But anyway, I digress. The letters uh, of the alphabet, like I said, are equivalent in some ways to the elements on the periodic table. Um, writing out hydrogen all the time, or Li, which is lithium, gets to be a real drag. And I'll talk in this class how sometimes chemists are lazy. And it doesn't mean that we don't do anything, it just means we don't want to write out hydrogen and lithium all the time. So this guy, Berzelius, was the first one to suggest we should use these symbols, all right? And some of the symbols make sense. So for example, H is hydrogen, that's not too bad. Li is lithium, that's okay. But to our English language, Na doesn't sound at all like sodium. Na is from the Latin term for sodium, which was natrium. So sometimes the letters will make sense to you as ink, people studying English, and sometimes they won't. K is potassium, so that's really weird and stuff. HG right there is mercury. So again, just be aware that some of them make more sense than others. <clears throat> um, they are working on more elements too. There are several groups around the world that are working on some heavier ones. I'll talk later at the end of this term why I'm so excited when we get to element 121. I'm going to save that as a teaser for a future lecture, but when we get to 121, it's going to reshape the periodic table. 
There's also some pre-biblical elements. These are the oldest ones known. So before the time of about 2,000-ish years ago, uh, people knew about gold, silver, copper, etc., etc. But there were a lot of them, of course, they didn't. Most of the elements were found, I would argue, from the 1700s on up. And now a magication lesson in chemistry. Need help remembering the periodic table? Try this simple phrase. Harry Herman liked being big, because not one forest near National Mount Goon allowed sick, puny Sasquatches. Clearly arbitrary, this kick caused scads of tiny vermin to cry. <laughs> And that's how you remember the periodic table. Okay, so I put this up here because first of all, I want to make you smile. Second reason is because I want to talk about people always ask me, should I memorize the periodic table? And a lot of times in high school classes, they'll make you memorize the first 18, the first 36, whatever elements. In this class, you never have to memorize the periodic table, all right? I, you will have, in quizzes and exams, a periodic table in front of you. And it's got the names, it's got the symbols, it's got the numbers and stuff like that. Uh, it's in the companion if you want to see what it looks like. And you'll always have that in front of you. Now that being said, it is nice to know that potassium is K and it's over there. It's nice to know that arsenic is AS and not AR argon, those kind of things. So if you have time to become more familiar with it, it does help. I won't buy, all right? And if you have been memorizing periodic table, awesome. <laughs> a lot of times when I'm bored, I'll try and write out the periodic table from memory and stuff. This is just something I do. Now, the first elements are definitely more important than the latter elements, all right? So for example, fluorovium, which is 114, by the way, the most volatile metal found yet, apparently, according to a paper I read recently. But anyway, fluorovium is not one we'll use a lot, all right? So if you look at the first ones, that's cool. So passively, look at them, kind of low that sulfur's on the right, all right, and magnesium's on the left, that would be cool, but you do not have to memorize anything per se. Any questions on that? <clears throat> the periodic table uh, is just chemist's way to kind of look and see what the letters of our alphabet are. The first one was uh, proposed by Mendeleev, which is fantastic. His looked a lot different than uh, the one we have right now. But what was really cool about his prediction is he predicted some elements that would exist before they had been found, and that was really, really cool. Uh, the modern version of the periodic table, of course, looks like the one we have. Now notice that this one is also a little bit out of date. I don't have the newest ones and stuff. Originally, Mendeleev wanted to organize by the mass, how much it like weighed, if you will, for each one. Now they're organized by the atomic number, which are these whole numbers, and we'll talk about that in a future lecture. So this is the current version and stuff that's used. Um, periodic tables are useful not only to know where the elements are, but you also find that up and down, there's some similarities in the elements. So for example, Na sodium is a lot like K potassium. All right, and on the far right, uh, neon, which is the gas, is very similar to helium, the gas. We'll talk about how there's some ways to make predictions as to properties uh, using the periodic table uh, coming up here pretty soon. You can make a periodic table table, <laughs> which I find hilarious for some reason on a personal level. Uh, I don't recommend it. You can see that this periodic table, first of all, is missing all these elements, so you'd have to rebuild the periodic table. And first of all, you can even have cool shirts, by the way, of periodic tables. But anyway, if you're bored and into construction, you can do stuff like that. Now, to summarize on one sheet of paper, all the potential things that could happen in chemistry not only in chemistry, but in all fields of science, physical science, that is, uh, and maybe in engineering. The one sheet of paper I'd give you would be the periodic table. That's everything we ever will do in science is summarized here. All the compounds that we'll ever make will come just from combining these elements, these hundred odd elements on this one sheet of paper. The number of compounds that could be made potentially out of this are practically countless. We now know of maybe 10 million compounds, but with only perhaps five elements, thinking of the ways we could combine them, we could potentially make 
10 billion compounds. So if we were to combine many, many elements from the periodic table, the number becomes absolutely enormous. So basically from just the study of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, there's roughly 10 million-ish compounds. And by the way, a compound is when you mix different elements together. But that's just focusing on a small part of the periodic table. And in my graduate work at Dartmouth, I created some compounds that nobody had ever done before. Nobody had ever found them. And they're not going to cure cancer or anything like that. Darn it, I can't make money off them. Double oh, darn it. However, it, I was the first one. All right, And that's kind of a cool thing to do. And you could do this too if you decide to go into chemistry. So just realize the periodic table is pretty cool. Now this is maybe an even better example of how the periodic table is awesome. Most cell phones, all right, I don't care if you're droid or iPhone by the way, but anyway, most of them have about a third of the naturally occurring elements inside, which is just crazy. A cell phone is actually a great representation of the power of the periodic table, because there's different silicons and metals inside, they have a little bit of gold and jazz like that. So your cell phone actually has about a third of the periodic table elements inside it. Go chemistry. Now, this is an equivalent of a home movie for chemistry. They're really, really small, like I said earlier. Now, a meter is this long, <laughs> all right? This uh, is a series of copper atoms, and the copper atoms from one copper to the next is 1.8 nanometers, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So freaking small, that's all you have to know. <laughs> all right, and so you can't take even normal photographs or use normal light most of the time for pictures like this. You have to use really special techniques, and we'll talk about some of these as we go through. An atom is the smallest piece of an element that still has properties of the element itself. So let's say I had a big thing of gold here, and I split my gold in half. Well, the new half would be equivalent to the other, it would have similar melting points, boiling points, whatever. But I can cut that half into a half and make a fourth, cut it again, cut, 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 cut. I'll finally get down to an atom. And if I were to cut the atom in half, it wouldn't be gold anymore. We'll talk more about what this means on a chemical level pretty soon. So an atom, which by the way can be cut, but it's very difficult, very, very difficult to cut uh, usually. An atom is the smallest piece which still has properties of the whole. So like gold conducts electricity well, that's why it's in cell phones. It wouldn't, if I cut that gold atom in half, it wouldn't be good for conducting electricity probably. Atoms have gone through different uh, philosophies as to what they look like, quote unquote, but the current model looks something like this. Atoms are spherical, like little marbles, all right? And most of the marble volume, the area within the marble, is basically made up of electrons. And in the very, very middle right there is the nucleus. And the nucleus has the protons and the neutrons. There's different forces at work in the atoms, but all the atoms, something like this, all right? Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. They're all freaking small compared to you and me, all right? But they, some of the atoms are bigger relative to the other atoms and stuff. We will definitely be talking more about the structure of the atoms in upcoming lectures, so hang tight. Now, a compound, which I mentioned earlier, is when you have mixtures of atoms coming together. And honestly, compounds are where it's at, <laughs> all right? This morning, I jazzed up a lot on caffeine. <laughs> Who drank the gel with my friend Paul? No, seriously, caffeine is really, obviously really good in coffee or tea and stuff like that. Caffeine is a mixture of different atoms. It's a compound, all right? So compounds are usually more exciting than the elements they came from. Another interesting thing is that the elements themselves will have quite different properties from the compound you make. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, this is actually a compound that you will make if you take Chem 223 with me. This is what they call a nickel dimethylglyoxine molecule. You don't need to worry about that. Don't let the terms make you nervous or anything. But you will actually create it. It's this kind of red kind of solid up here. Um, this has many different types of atoms inside. The silver one here in the middle is the nickel. Black is oftentimes carbon. White is often hydrogen. Uh, oxygen sometimes is red. Nitrogen is blue. This is a representation of the molecule that we will actually make in Chem 223, which is cool. Now, <clears throat> this is the first time I'm going to introduce what's called an eye clicker question, all right, or just a clicker question. 
Um, iClickers are kind of fun. iClicker is a way that you can participate in the lecture. So instead of just listening to me babble on about, you know, Star Trek or whatever, or some, excuse me, chemistry, um, or listening to my bad jokes, an iClicker is something you can actually participate in during class. And what I'll do here in a little bit is I'll have a question, and there'll be up to five possible answers. And if you have an iClicker, you can push A, B, C, D, or E, make your prediction what, the, what you think the answer is, and then we'll actually talk about what the answer to the question is itself. An iClicker, about 40, 50 bucks on Amazon, all right? It is worth extra credit to you if you get one, but it's absolutely optional, it's not required. It's a fun thing to have, but it's not something you have to have, all right? If you don't have an iClicker, just use a piece of paper and write down what you think the answer is, and then we'll talk about it. You'll get the same effect that way. However, if you do have money that you're interested in spending on it, uh, it is kind of a fun thing to do, FYI. Any questions on that? Yes? Does so it have to be an iClicker 2? Um, an iClicker 1 has worked in the past, so I think that will work as well. Um, don't buy the electronic version. Um, we haven't had good enough Wi-Fi to make that work. So it has to be a physical iClicker. That's the only thing I would say. But yeah, if you have an iClicker 1, I think we can pack it. Okay. So here's our first iClicker question. All right, and the question is, which of the following is not a compound? Now, a compound, like I said, is a mixture of different atoms together. So if you look down here to drinking alcohol, just say no, kids. Anyway, drinking alcohol is ethanol. It's the active ingredient in beer and wine, all that stuff. Wow, lots of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, more than one type of element. That's a compound, all right? So that one would not be the answer. Sugar, on the other hand, has lots of different types of atoms in it, 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, etc. That's a compound. Same thing for water, hydrogen and oxygen. Same thing for table salt, sodium chloride. But you can probably see then that good old potassium, that's an element by itself. So that would not be a compound. Potassium is an element. And if you're ever unsure, you can go up to the periodic table, and there's good old potassium right there. Potassium by itself, that's going to be an element, not a compound. Any questions on that? <clears throat> there's two types of compounds, and that designation is important as we talk about different things. The first one is what they call an ionic compound. And most of the time, if you have metals in your compound, it will be ionic. Ionic has a positive-negative interaction, and we'll talk more about this as we go on. But ionic compounds have much different properties from the other kind of compound, which is covalent, punchline. These are molecular compounds as well. They have more than one type of atom in them. So water has hydrogen and oxygen. My beloved caffeine has carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And this is caffeine, by the way. <clears throat> these are both really also important, but none of these have any metals in them. And most of the time, if you have a non-metallic compound, most of the time, those will be what's called covalent. And a covalent compound shares the electrons across the atoms. The metals will usually give up their electrons to the nonmetals, so you have a positive negative thing going on, but covalent molecules will share. So we'll talk more about ionic and covalent in future lectures. I'm kind of foreshadowing some of the things we're going to be looking at and stuff. Um, I also did want to talk about the formulas. Molecular formulas are really important. So water is H2O. Caffeine had that wild structure that was there before. The structure just kind of helps us to figure out how many atoms are inside a molecule and stuff like that. Any questions? Okay, this is a good place to stop. We'll continue on with chapter one on Wednesday at nine o'clock. If you have questions on anything, email me. I'm all over it. I'm really glad to have you here. Have a great day.